I'm backing up my truck, I'm gonna hook it up, loading up my boat with all my gear. I've been working hard all week, trying to make ends meet, spending time wishing I was fishing. Well, Terry Wickstrom wants to take you fishing. Gather up your gear and come along. Well, Terry Wickstrom wants to take you fishing. This is Terry Wickstrom. Join Karen Collum, Greg Collagio, and me as we take you to some of our favorite fishing spots from Colorado to Minnesota, the Arctic Circle to Central America and beyond. As we revisit episodes of Mountain States Fishing and Angling Adventures Television on the best of fishing with Terry Wickstrom. I got one on the grub. Got one? Yeah. Oh. Oh boy, they're feisty. Brook trout are fi strong fighters, right? Oh, they? they are. That's all, this particular pond is all brook trout, is that right? Yeah. Oh, nice, what a nice brook trout. Look at that. Beautiful. On a little ultralight with like two to four pound test line. I'll tell you what, you use light gear or the right fly rod, these are all you can handle. Well, you know, in addition, while we're up here, I'm trying to talk and he's running me all over the place. <laughs> and we're going to go fish some. You're not very far from the um, flat top wilderness area. And there's some great just public wilderness lakes up there, aren't there? Yeah, there sure are. In fact, that's what we're going to do. Go after some trophy brook trout in some of those lakes later on this afternoon. Uh-huh. Well, boy, that's a nice brook there. Boy, that is. That's a beautiful brook trout. He's just hooked in the top what of it. What is he, 14? You know, I don't have 15? a ruler. I don't have a ruler with me, but he's over 12. Get the hook out of him here and get him back in the water. Keep him in the water so we don't hurt him. That's a beautiful brook trout. Get that net out of the way. Look at the colors. They are such a beautiful fish. That's that's a nice brook trout anywhere. That's nice one. Yeah. Get him back in the water. There he goes. Thank you, Mr. Brook Trout. That was fun. Got a weed. I got a fish. Boy, they like this grub. Well, they do. <laughs> You're having too much fun. I'm gonna have to let you use this. Man, these things are scrappy. I oh, look at them run. I <laughs> Oh, these brook trout, I tell you, you know what? The brook trout are an underfished resource in Colorado, too. What an incredible fish. Look at that. You know what? I don't think it's legal to have this much fun. <laughs> well, that's another nice one. Well, oh, I guess. You know, Pat, if you were to twist my arm real hard, I'd probably come back up here someday. You think so? <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> I mean, anybody who couldn't come up here and have fun. All right, let's hold still. I'm going to let you go. Boy, these brookies are getting a little bigger than I thought. Yeah. I didn't want to net him because I'm going to let him go. Now he's tangled up in my clippers. He's probably going to break off here in a minute. Boy, that's a nice brookie. Oh, that is. That's a beautiful brook trout. Oh, what great fighters and what beautiful fish. I'll tell you what, they're good eating too. You bet. Not I keeping think they're it. the best of the trout. They are. Them and lake trout I love. I'm not going to keep any to eat today, but what a beautiful fish. You know, the diversity of fishing in Colorado is so good. You've got to get out, and if you haven't experienced some of these upper level lakes, the alpine type lakes and ponds, and places like Eagle Rock, you've just got to get up and try it. It's so much fun. Get you back in the water. Thank you, Mr. Brook Trout. Well, Pat, you know, I was catching them on the jig, and I gave you the jig and switched with you. I'll tell you. I'm going to have to rub it in a little. <laughs> Where's he going? Oh, here he comes. Here he comes up. There he is. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I'm kind of getting bored with this. I think I'll have to do something else. <laughs>
This is, this is so much fun. These are such incredibly beautiful brook trout. Boy, they are scrappy. <laughs> you know, I'm going to release this one right down in the water. Just unhook him from the fly and let him go. Pretty fish. Well, they are, and there he goes. When I cast the jig out, I let it fall. Uh -huh. And then as soon as it falls, I just, I don't reel at all to move it. I pick the line up with the rod so I can feel them. So stop reeling now. Let it fall, lift it with the rod. Now reel your slack in, but don't reel the rod. Let it fall. Reel your slack in, let it fall. Reel your slack in, okay. let it fall like that. What that'll do is, when they suck that jig in, uh -huh. You can't feel them, and if you're turning the rod, sometimes it's real difficult. But if you're moving the jig with the rod, you'll feel it as soon as they pick it up, and then you can snap to set that hook in them pretty okay. good. Okay. Oh, let's let it sit for a minute. I just had a bite. There, there you go. go. There you go. There you go. Hooked up on him. Well, I just have to have an expert show me how. <laughs> That's okay. That's all right. That's all. Uh, jigs are little light rods like that with jigs are su such an incredible yeah. way to fish. I mean, that light rod, it feels like you've got a monster. What it is sure a nice does. brook trout. Look at him go. Oh, they're scrappy. And on that light tackle like that, that's just a little Berkeley two inch smoke power grub uh -huh. on a little maybe 16 ounce head. And you know, that'll catch just about anything that swims. <laughs> Oh, he's nice. Oh, yeah. So I'll get him for you since I got my waders on. There we go. <laughs> oh, nice fish. First time I ever had somebody take fish. The hook yeah, usually, fish you're, probably for me. you're probably usually <laughs> doing this for somebody else, right? There you go. All right. What's that? What? That's about a 12. What do you think? I just think he's closer to 14, I would say. Nice, fat, beautiful brook trout who wants to be back in the water. We're going to let him go anyway. Yeah. Good job, sir. Thank you. Hey, and thank you for inviting us up here. You know what? Even Pat can catch these fish. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's just a, what an incredible place to be and what a great place to fish. You know, well, we got to get out and explore some of the other alpine lakes around, so we're going to go. But man, I tell you, what a tremendous place to fish. Thank All you right. again. You bet. But after we fished there for a while, we went up to meet George, um, a high alpine lake. How would you describe the kind of lake we were fishing there, guys? Well, um, you know, Roger, why don't you go ahead and take that since uh, you took us I'd to the lake. I'd say it sits about 9,500 feet. Um, just, I would say depth on that is maybe 30 at most. Uh, it, uh, it's just a great rookie lake that that's all that lake produces. That's, is that typical? You know, you get into the high mountain lakes, there's lots of little alpine lakes like that that are just full of trout, isn't there? Yeah, there sure is, Terry, and, and I think that there's a couple components that make the alpine lakes really productive, uh, particularly some of the ones that we fish, but you really need a good oxygen level up there. The underwater springs is very important, and then the uh, forage base in which these fish are feeding on. For the most part, um, scuds and leeches are their primary food. Uh, but when we happened to be there, we were fortunate enough to get them in the fall. And what they were doing, were chasing some smaller bait fish up onto the points and then crashing the bait. And that's where some of the patterns that we were using really imitated the bait fish well. Hey, why don't you join us out on the lake and just see how much fun it was up at that high alpine lake. Mm, nice so it fish, It looks like George. you hit the bead head leech, you know. Look at the colors on these fish, Terry. Oh, is that spawn. a beautiful that fish? Golden. Beautiful, beautiful fish. Get that handy there. Got it. Look at the colors. Oh, oh! Wow, fall mountain brookies. Is that? Look at the belly. What a fire red. What a beautiful fish. There you go. Feels like a better fish. Feel like a good one, George? 
Uh, it's, it's not bad. Not a bad one, Perry. You need help or you got it? No, I think I should be okay. On the bead head again. The blood leech. Oh, they're feisty, aren't they? They sure are. I'll tell you what, pound for pound, they fight as good as any trout or any fish you can find. They sure do, especially get them up in this environment. This clear water, well, this is what a great setting. What? Not a real big one, but a beauty. Nice Beautiful colors. Looking fish, a nice fight. Took that one on the bloodhead leech, Terry. Some of the patterns that we were using up there on the circle hooks is an elk haired caddis, a blood leech, and a scud, and, these, and an egg pattern as well. These particular patterns were tied by John Stamet of Shasta Fly and Rod out of Shasta, California. Um, what's unique about the circle hooks is that they have a 95% lip hook rate. They always hook the fish in the corner of the mouth and they're easier to release so that you don't have any gut hook fish or kill any fish from there. What's nice about these is that you have a variety of styles of patterns that you can tie on there. These particular patterns, the serendipity, the brassies, and the soft hackle were tied by Jim Shearer of the Goofus Bug. And the circle hooks are nickel Teflon coated so you have a faster presentation into the fish's mouth. They offer a variety of sizes in these finishes and in the circle hooks right there. What's really nice about these Terry is that it gives you the ability to not harm the fish when you go in to release them. So uh, the versatility of the pattern is really what's going to work out the best for us. And we're real comfortable uh, in the points, the way they're curving up, and the curvature and the angle. And what happens there is that the hook actually rotates into the fish's mouth. And what's nice about these, particularly when you're nymph or scud fishing or leech fishing, is that you do not set the hook when the fish takes the fly. All you do is when you get a tight line, is strip the fish in or retrieve him in on your fly reel, whatever you're more comfortable. If you set the hook with these patterns, with this particular style of hook, you will miss every fish. You know, George, I'm not an experienced belly boater. In fact, I've done very little of it until this uh, trip. Tell me, if you were going to buy, now this one's kind of a pontoon shape, that's even more of a boat shape than we see the round ones like some of the other guys with us are in. How do you choose or what, what, what are some of the factors that go into choosing the right kind for you? Well, I think the biggest factor more than anything is the budget. You know, how much money do you have to spend and how much are you going to utilize it? If you're going to use it a lot, then I'd recommend spending a little bit more money and getting something a little bit better. Uh, you know, if you're only going to do it every now and then, then it, it doesn't pay. The round boats are probably the least expensive and were the original belly boats. And it's something like you're using, that U-boat uh, came into popularity several years ago and are a little bit more hydrodynamic so it goes through the, through the water a little bit easier. And then of course if you upgrade to something like I have here, uh, this is called an outcast boat and it's nice because it gets you out of the water. You know Terry, if you get up early spring or late fall like we're doing now, the water's cold. Oh, obviously. And it's nice to be out of the water like this, and it's worth a little bit more investment because you can carry a lot of cargo, a lot of tackle with you. If you wanted to put a trolling motor on it, you could do that. You have the oars and your kick fins. So it really gives you a lot of mobility and a lot of flexibility as far as different types of water that you can fish. Uh, some of them actually can be used in white water. This one happens to be one that you can uh, and you need to check to make sure that, you know, some of them are capable of handling the white water. And they have an anchoring system and they're just very comfortable. It's, I see there's quite a variety of things. They're, they're an excellent way to fish. You know, for the guy who just wants to get out, and, well, for fishing a, an alpine lake like this, where you, you, the road we came in, you couldn't pull a boat trailer up that oh, road. Oh, no, absolutely. Now we had a hard enough time with the four-wheel drives. Or if someplace you're going to hike in even, you can take some of these belly boats. And uh, still, you can get out in the water and fish the lake a little better than you can from shore. Like a lake that drops off as quickly as this one, uh, you could fish this from shore, but it'd be difficult to cover it properly. I was just going to say that to you because it drops off so fast, it's very difficult to wade fish. But there's certainly enough open areas around the lake to shore fish from. Uh, but I agree with you, the flexibility is nice to have. And they're lightweight, durable, compact, and, and affordable. George, 
why don't you explain a little bit to the people the kind of area we're fishing and why this would hold the brook trout here? Well, what we're fishing is a traditional point, okay? And what's nice about this point, is, well, there's several things that are nice about this particular point, but the point comes out very shallow right up on the grass, and it comes out about to, almost to about where we are in relatively shallow, shallow area. And it's very uh, big rocks and gravel, so it's a hard bottom there. On the right-hand side of the point, we have a little island with some grass and a mud, and it's a deep drop off with a weed bed sitting there. So you have fish moving around in that area on the right-hand side of the point there, as well as that other little island. On this side of the point, it's a deep gravel bar that drops off, again, quick off of the island or off of, the, off of this particular point. And it's a uh, big chunk rock and a lot, of, a lot of gravel down there. And it's a deep drop off, and what they were doing is, is uh, you know, as we saw when we were close to shore, there was like, you know, uh, uh, tons and tons, like big schools of minnows and bait fish. And what they were doing is they're circling, like three or four of them, will, they're bunching up, they're schooling the bait fish, and then they're circling them around and then driving them straight in with the wind into the point. And once they get them up into the shallow water, they're crashing the bait in there. And then every couple minutes, you'll see them circulate back around, you'll see the bait fish scatter, and then you'll see them hitting them in there. Uh, and there's, of course, if you drop out, we have a log behind us, so you have some structure there. And again, you have deep water on both sides of the point, so it holds a lot of fish in the fall. They're closer to the bottom and still come up on these shelves to feed. You know, what you went through was a description of very similar to what a bass fisherman would go through in a warm water lake. And you know, as people start thinking, you know, they think that, oh, I fish bass, or I fish walleyes, and, or I fish trout. And it's amazing if you understand forage and how bait fish and insects and leeches and things like that, the kinds of bottoms and things they react to, and the f basic needs of all fish, you know. They want some deep water sanctuary. That's they want right. a place to trap the bait fish. They want uh, cover, and if you understand those, most of the species that we pursue, they may be different temperature levels of the lake or different types of water, but they look for similar types of uh, features in the lake. Right there. Oh, there's a pickup. Oh, right, there we go. right close. Look at that. He was close. Oh yeah. Oh, nice Ooh. fish. Boy, oh, those are pretty fish. Look how pretty, beautiful. Look at look at the look at the colors on that one. Oh, that's a nice fish. That's a beautiful fish. Here, I'll hold you steady so that you can get them. That is beautiful. These colors. Right, now look at that right in the corner of the mouth with that circle hook, Terry. Oh yeah. Remember I was telling you about those circle hooks? Right. That's a circle fly hook. I got that fish right in the corner of the mouth. A little later on, we're going to give you a close-up of the hook George is talking about, but it's a new design hook by Eagle Claw, isn't that right? Yes, it is. It's brand new. As a matter of fact, we just introduced it. Look at this male. This hook jaw is coming up. Oh. Yeah, be careful. And he's getting all set to spawn this fall. But you see how it's got him right in the corner there? Oh, yeah. Right there at that little blood leech. Always right in the corner. And it comes right out, and, and you get that release. And there he goes. There he goes. There he goes. That's all right. Another one. We'll let that one spawn. Good job, sir. Thank you very much. You don't mind a wet one. Nah, that's all right. They're all really nice looking flies. The ones we had the most success with on this trip were the, the bloodhead leech and the scud pattern, right? And yes. We, and, and you had those most of the time tied together, one on a dropper from the other? Or? Right. We did a tandem, actually, as opposed to a dropper, and just tied the scud directly to the hook uh, shank and just let it fall right behind it. Okay. Well, tell us a little bit about this hook. It's unique. It's got some qualities that are going to that really are going to be a benefit to trout fishermen everywhere. There absolutely is. I think the first and, and foremost thing is that it's an American-made hook. It's in our Fetalite series, and it's nickel Teflon coated for a faster penetration into the fish's mouth, Terry. But the unique things about it are threefold. Number one, you'll get a higher hookup percentage. You'll get a 95% lip hook rate. And you don't have to worry about gut hooking any of the fish for catch and release fishing to protect our fisheries from a conservation standpoint. Just from the shape, you can see because it's rounded in, it would be difficult to hook down in the gut of a fish. But yet when it turns in their mouth, it automatically almost sets itself. For lip hooking. That's absolutely correct. Uh, what happens there, Terry, is, is that when the fish inhales the fly, the hook will actually rotate into the corner of the fish's mouth and get them right here or right here. What we do need to be careful for the public out there is to tell them that if they set the hook with a circle hook, they will not catch the fish. They'll pull it right out of their mouth. That's correct. They've got to let the hook, the fish turn and let the hook just move naturally into the corner of their mouth. Exactly. Just let the, swim fit, the fish swim mm -hmm. off. And uh, once you get a tight line, all you do is strip your fish in or reel them in. 
Well, guys, I had a great time up there fishing in that high mountain lake. Um, you talked to me about it for months, and we finally went up there, and I really enjoyed it. I want to uh, thank all of you for taking me up there. Dave, thanks for going with me. Thanks, Jerry. George. Had fun. My pleasure. Roger. Thank you, Jerry. And thank you, folks, for joining us on Mountain States Fishing Adventures, and we'll see you next week.